Hi folks, welcome back to Math with Captain Rod. Uh, the purpose of this video is somewhat twofold here. It's to demonstrate, you know, purpose one is to uh, demonstrate how to work in proper integrals, especially in the context of surface area and volume calculations. And second is to discuss a very unique or very cool type of geometry called uh, Gabriel's Horn. So, first of all, let talk about where geometrically this thing comes from, Gabriel's Horn. It comes from the curve 1 over x, which I've plotted here, revolved around the x-axis from 1 to infinity. So if you imagine this area right here revolved about the x-axis, we're going to get this geometry. It's going to look something like this. That first radius right there would be a 1, and then the radius goes to 0 as x goes to infinity. And we're going to walk through a couple calculations here. Uh, we're going to calculate this thing's surface area and its volume. So we're going to start with the volume calculation. So in order to calculate this thing's volume, the first thing we're going to want to do here is draw ourselves our differential elements, same as always. And now we imagine this element right here revolved about the x-axis. If we do, if we do that, we're going to get a disk-shaped geometry. The radius of this disk is equal to the function value. 1 over x. The width is a dx, if I write this in differential form. The volume dv is going to equal the surface area, now that's going to be this surface area right here, that circular surface area, which is pi r squared, or pi times, oops, I already have a pi there, pi times 1 over x squared, and then we'll multiply by dx to make it a volume. So that expression gives the volume of the infinitely small disk you get when we revolve this element about the x-axis. Now, the total volume we're going to get by adding them all up. So we're going to be adding up the integral pi 1 over x squared dx. And x is going to start here at 1 and go to infinity because this curve is defined infinitely far to the right. Now this is an example of an improper integral, an integral where we have an infinity in the limit. So how we typically handle that, I'm going to rewrite it limit as b goes to infinity, integral 1 to b of pi times 1 over x squared dx, which is going to equal, let's see, limit as b goes to infinity. Now the pi can be brought out in front of the integral. Um, integral 1 to b, 1 over x squared dx equals, okay, limit as b goes to infinity. Boy, when you put these limits in here, you have quite a bit more writing. Pi times, now, the integral of 1 over x squared dx, that's x to the minus 2, that's going to integrate to minus 1 over x, evaluated 1 to b. So that's x to the minus 2, add 1 to the power would be minus 1, divide by your new power minus signs. What I usually do with these minus signs is absorb them into the limits. So I'm going to write this limit as b goes to infinity, pi times 1 over x evaluated from b to 1. So all I've done here is taken this minus sign and absorbed it into the limits, which would reverse them. So that's going to equal limit as b goes to infinity of pi times 1 over 1 minus 1 over b. Now, the 1 over 1 is just 1. Limit as b goes to infinity. As b goes to infinity, this term goes to 0 right here. And our value ends up being pi times 1, which is pi. So Gabriel's horn has a volume that uh, is finite and equal to pi, 3.14159, yada, 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 cubic units. So I'll go ahead and write that down. So the volume of this thing's pi cubic units. I'm going to take a moment here and screenshot this for uh, future saving. Okay, so there's the volume calculation. 
pretty much just like every other standard volume calculation that you ran a class in, in a first or second semester calculus course, other than it's an improper integral because the uh, limit is to infinity. And then how you handle that, we typically will put a value there, we'll say b, and then later on take limit as b goes to infinity. That's the proper calculus way to handle that. All right, now we're going to take a look at the surface area. And by surface area here, we're talking about like how, you know, how much paint would it take to paint this geometry? Oops, not what I wanted to do. So for the surface area calculation, we need an element that's a surface area element. I'm going to draw this element in red to make sure it's easy to see. So my little element here, I'm going to start with this, a little ds. This is a little arc length. And if we kind of blow this up, here's my ds. I can call that a dx in this vertical dimension, a dy. And dx, ds, and dy are related by Pythagorean theorem. dx squared plus dy squared equals ds squared. Right now, I don't have an area yet. I can turn this one dimensional ds into an area by revolving it about the x-axis, and just like we did the rectangle. However, when we revolve this thing about the x-axis, what we get is a ring. Kind of a hollow ring. The area of that ring we can get by taking ds and multiplying by the distance around. You know, what you have to do is imagine cutting this with some scissors and unfolding it. It basically would be a long rectangle. Area, length times width. Now, the distance around is one circumference, 2 pi r, where r is described by the function value here in this case, 1 over x. So ds times 2 pi times 1 over x would give the area of the red ring. The total area, we would have to add these all up, starting at 1 and going to infinity again. So we're going to have 2 pi times 1 over x ds. And I'm going to get ds from right over here. ds is equal to the square root of dx squared plus dy squared. These surface area integrals tend to look a little funny until you get them sorted out a little bit. All right, so this is 2 pi r, and this is ds. That's this little distance right here. That gives the area of this ring. Now, when working these types of problems, <clears throat> the next step is to factor out either the dx or the dy. You typically choose which based on what you have going on over here. Since I have a function of x here, the easiest thing to do is going to be factor out a dx and integrate with respect to x. If we do, this is now going to read integral 1 to infinity, 2 pi uh, times, I'll actually write it, 2 pi over x. Now, this part right here, when we factor out a dx squared from this term, we end up with 1 plus dy dx, the quantity squared. This is an algebra step that's very important for when working uh, either arc length or these types of area problems. So you factor a dx squared from these two terms, this is what you get. And you know you can back check it with multiplication. This product is equal to dx squared, and then this product, the dx's squared, would cancel and leave you a dy squared. When you square root that dx squared, you get just dx. I'm going to go ahead and put this over here. Left under the radical, is the quantity 1 plus dy dx squared. So I'm going to write it like this to save myself some time. 1 plus dy dx squared. Now, I'm looking at my function. My function is 1 over x. So dy dx would be minus 1 over x squared. So this term that's going to go here is going to be minus 1 over x squared squared. 
And again, that's coming from dy dx, the quantity squared. And, and make sure it's absolutely clear, this is not a second derivative. This is not d squared y dx squared. This is dy dx, first derivative, squared. And again, I'm getting that from this function. Okay, so let me rewrite this one more time. So our area total is going to equal integral 1 to infinity, 2 pi times 1 over x times square root of 1 plus 1 over x to the fourth dx. I'm going to take a moment here and pause this and just make sure that the uh, group I got listening to this is all, uh, all up to speed. All right, folks, so I'm back here. had a little discussion with my class about uh, the mathematics of this that I want to add to the video here. So here's our integral for the area of Gabriel's horn. And the first thing to realize is this is a reasonably tough integral here. You know, if I were working this, the only method I would even humor trying is a numerical method using Excel. Um, you might try something like integration by parts, but the integrate, you know, this is going to be a tough integral. So now we're going to talk a little bit about whether or not the thing even converges. Some integrals going to infinity converge, others don't. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of some stuff I don't need anymore. And we're just going to spend the rest of the time talking about the convergence of that integral, whether it does or not and why. So I'm going to take this guy here, move it up here. Now, when testing for convergence, there's a couple different ways to do it. Uh, I mean, one is, can you just work the integral? And I'm looking at this thing, and I'm like, hmm, that's a pretty tough integral here. Let's, let's abandon that approach for now. Second are what I call left-right comparisons here. And here's what I mean by a left-right comparison. Let's say I've got two functions here, f of x and g of x. And let's say that we know that integral 1 to infinity of g of x dx converges is convergent, we'll say. And I know that f of x is less than g of x for all values on this interval. If f of x is less than g of x for all values on the interval, and g of x is convergent, then f of x, the integral f of x um, on the interval, integrated on the interval, must be convergent as well. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to think about a diff some different functions to compare this to, and one of them that comes to mind is is this. Uh, just the function, I'll go ahead and include the 2 pi. Actually, we, we don't even need to include the 2 pi, I guess. Oops. Don't need that anymore. All right. We're going to compare this to the integral 1 to infinity of 1 over x dx, which is a nice simple integral. Now, this is an improper integral, so we would write it limit as b goes to infinity, integral 1 to b of 1 over x dx, and this is equal to limit as b goes to infinity. Now the integral of 1 over x dx is natural log x evaluated at uh, from 1 to b, so that's going to be natural log b minus natural log of 1. Now first I want to talk about where did I get this function from. Well, it's the simplest possible function I can think of that I can compare very easily to this, and I'll talk about the comparison here in just a moment. This function is fairly easily shown to be divergent. When we try to work the integral here, minus ln of 1 is no problem. Natural log of 1 is 0. But natural log of b as b goes to infinity, natural log of b also goes to infinity. So this integral is a divergent integral, no doubt. Now, um, now that we've shown that's divergent now, get rid of this, and we're going to compare to this function here. I'm going to compare the function uh, 1 over x to 1 over x square root 1 plus 1 over x to the fourth. If I give this a function name, let's say f, and this one g. Now they both have a 2 pi in front of it. If we want to include the 2 pi for this discussion, we can, or we, 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 can. we don't have to. I, I can put a 2 pi here and a 2 pi here would be fine. The 2 pi's don't matter because they're the same. Uh, but the facts are this. G is guaranteed to be bigger than F. 
and I really don't even need the equality there, because 2 pi over x, 2 pi over x. But then we look over to the right. On the right here, this 2 pi over x is multiplied by square root of 1 plus 1 over x to the fourth. 1 over x to the fourth is positive definite, which means 1 plus something positive is bigger than 1. After you square root it, still bigger than 1. So this product right there is larger than 1 for all values of x from 1 to infinity. Therefore, f of x is less than g of x. And we just showed before that this integral, 1 over x from 1 to infinity, is divergent. Oops. I think I actually uh, mixed up what I wanted to call f and g, but I guess in this case here, this one is the one we're trying to figure out, the g. And then f is this integral. I mean, f of x is this function, uh, basically the 1 over x. This one is bigger than this one. And we just showed that this one integrated 1 to infinity is divergent. That guarantees this function integrated 1 to infinity is divergent. Therefore, this integral has no answer to it. Or we'd say that it has an uh, infinite surface area. So this is a decent example of how you test for convergence. Here I tested by comparing 1 over x to 1 over x square root 1 plus 1 over x to the fourth. Knowing that 1 over x was easily compared left-right, that's you know greater than, less than is what I call left-right comparison. Uh, also knowing that this is pretty easily uh, tested for convergence. So I'll take a minute now and discuss the geometry. I'm going to save this though. So what we've just shown is a very curious thing. The geometry of Gabriel's horn has a finite volume, pi cubic units, but it has an infinite surface area, which should raise an interesting question here. See, how can this be if I can take this geometry and imagine now turning it into like a paint can. I'm going to just rotate it like this. I can fill this thing with paint. We can put paint in it and fill it right to the top. It would take 3.14 cubic units. But we can't paint it. Because it has infinite surface area. This is one of the cool kind of questions of mathematics that people discuss uh, here and there. And some of them use this argument to, to actually make the argument that infinity doesn't actually exist because the problem is occurring mathematically as x goes to infinity here. But we have a little bit of a geometric contradiction here, which I think is kind of cool, which is why I decided to uh, make a video. Uh, it's also a good video about how to do surface area calculations and volume calculations. Within the video is how to test for convergences. And then this discussion, kind of cool discussion about geometry here, because here's a geometry that has a finite volume, but an infinite surface area. So hope this video was kind of an interesting uh, look into Gabriel's horn and some of these methods. Um, have a great day.